Today's presenter, who is also a member of H3A, Mehmet Chuadar, graduated from Ankara University Classical Archaeology Department. He has worked at Konya Archaeology and Bodrum Underwater Archaeology Museums. Mehmet Chuadar has written several books about Konya in Cappadocia and has given lectures about Turkey's cultural heritage domestically and abroad. Today's presentation will take you through the beliefs and religions that emerge on or spread in Anatolia since the Neolithic age. This will be illustrated by a panorama of views of magnificent temples and sacred objects. You will also see how this translated into faith tourism in ancient times and today. Mehmet Bey, the hosting will be for you. In a, in a second. Okay. So, dear friends, uh, today we are going to tower, cover some of the religious sites uh, in Turkey and especially biblical sites and the sites important from the point of religion and so on and so on. As you all know, we have an amazing country uh, surrounded by interesting uh, countries like Iran and Syria, Iraq, which is full of really very early ancient sites also. Before I start, I would like to draw your attention to this map, you see, that shows the Holy Crescent. So where we have got earliest settlements of humankind. And in Turkey, up to the discovery of Göbekli Tepe, the most important site was Çatalhöyük. There was a Neolithic site discovered by James Mellat. And it was really a period called Neolithic Age, when people started uh, cultivating their land, domesticating animals, and then they stopped the hunting and food gathering period of the of the history. So Chatolik had a lot of interesting features. For example, these houses, they didn't have streets. People, they used to come to these houses through the roof by the means of ladders like this. When people died, they buried them underneath the floor. And uh, in these houses, we had uh, a lot of bull heads coated with mud, and bull was a sacred animal of the major divinity. And surprisingly, we had a lot of frescoes, murals, you see, discovered uh, on the walls of these houses. This interesting fresco showing eruption over one of the volcanoes in central Anatolia. When archaeologists found this fresco, they had it took time then, it took time to, for them to discover what it was, but uh, eventually they realized it was showing a Sanda volcano with two summits, and you see the houses of Çatalhöyük village, an Neolithic site, and the dating of this uh, mural or fresco, confirmed by carbon-14 method, is about 6,400 years before Christ. Uh, this is the volcano from that area and of course that period of time we don't have metals no writing yet uh, that's why obsidian volcanic glass obsidian was the main uh, metal or main uh, tool used uh, by the neolithic people you know, Neolithic age also represented in our part, if you go to Buffa Lake area, and if you climb to Latmos Mountain, uh, archaeologists discovered Neolithic age rock paintings. And they were different from the rock paintings of other in the other parts of the world because they didn't have any war, they didn't have any hunting animals. They were basically spring festivals and religious ceremonies done in the open air. And if you look at the, some of the drawings over here, you see 
mothers playing with their children and people dancing and people celebrating the spring uh, see festivals. That's not far from here. You can easily drive to Buffalo Lake and it takes time, of course, to climb the mountain. You have to stay perhaps a night in the village down there. And I was very big surprise we had when Göbekli Tepe was discovered uh, because it was nearly 3,000 years then, 3,000 years then older than Çatalhöyük. And what was shocking for the archaeologists, these people still, they were hunters and food gatherers. That means every day they have to struggle for their food. They had to go out from their caves or from their shelters and looking for animals or collecting food. And we don't know what kind of organization it was, but they managed to build this most incredible uh, circular shape uh, buildings. It's very much discussed whether they are temples or shrines or they had another, another function, but these people certainly directed by some leaders, perhaps religious leaders, they carried all these stones or heavy pillars and columns from a, a distant, distant uh, quarry and they erected them, as you can see, circles in circles. And archaeologists, they uh, discovered, in fact, they didn't excavate, but they discovered at least there were 20 of them in this uh, area. You know, uh, in this period of time, uh, by the way, this is a map of the area. Every day we are discovering new sites, even some of them older than Göbekli Tepe, for example, now Karahan uh, is getting very, very important. It is older than Göbekli Tepe. And another shocking feature of Göbekli Tepe was all this carving, showing uh, certain animals, especially. So we have great number of serpents, fox, and scorpions, and lions, And of course, we are talking about really sculpture, you see, nearly 12,000 years before our age or 10,000 years before Christ. They are exceptional, really, works of art for the whole world. And in Çatalhöyük and all these Neolithic cities, we have one divinity, I mean, basically, Mother Goddess of Anatolia and her cult continues all through these centuries. I mean, in Hittite area, in the Phrygians and so on and so on. Even uh, when we get to uh, Hittites, we have got similar uh, divinities. This carving was discovered in Ephesus. You see, this is mother goddess of Anatolia discovered over the mountains near Ephesus. And when we look at the Artemis from Ephesus, we see, we don't see the features of Greek Artemis, who is normally depicted as a young girl, but here we, we see her uh, with the features of Mother Goddess of Anatolia, all her power over fertility, she dominates over animals, and so on and so on. You know, copper is the first metal discovered in Anatolia, I mean, they started using. So we have Copper Age starting 5,000 years before Christ. Early Bronze Age, uh, we had a great discovery in the north of Ankara. Uh, Turkish archaeologists in 1930s, they discovered 13 royal tombs in the north of Ankara in Alajuk. So each tomb, like we see over here, we had the skeleton of one of the royal figures, see, and then a lot of religious symbols. We call them sun disks, so, and even they are called Hittite sun disks. In fact, it's totally wrong because these are Hatti uh, objects, you see, older than Hittite period. 
uh, dating to, to 2500 before Christ. You see 13 tombs, each tomb contained this amazing artifacts, you see, and even overshadowed the, the treasure of Shiliman, which discovered at Troy. And uh, you can see, for example, the symbol of sun. You have got stags and bull horns and then sun, all symbols of early Bronze Age, uh, see, divinities, gods and goddesses. You know, Hittites, they had great temples and one open air shrine, Yazilikaya. So if you have chance to go to Ankara, in the north of Ankara, there's Boaskalet, capital city of Hittites, Hittite Empire. So they had a lot of open air shrines and one of them was Yazilikaya, where you see all the gods and goddesses of Hittite, Hittite uh, Pantheon like 12 gods over here. You know, we have incredible number of biblical sites and also sites uh, from also uh, Old Testament, you see, from from Old Testament, for example, Ararat is mentioned, Arada is the place where uh, Noah's Ark landed, you see, so we have got we have got Tigris and Euphrates, I mean, mentioned in the Old Testament, Gardens of Eden. And now we have got Haran, where we do believe Abraham lived for a while. So, I mean, I don't want to take your precious time with these uh, Old Testament sites. You have a great list of them. So you would be surprised even some cities of Karya included, you see, in that list. You know, when we look at the temples, pagan temples, uh, like today, you see, they attracted a lot of tourists in the ancient times, and also a lot of people, they made pilgrimages. Of course, some of them, they were temples, some of them monumental tombs. As you all know, we have two of the seven wonders in Turkey, uh, the Temple of Artemis, Ephesus, and the mausoleum in uh, Halicarnassus. You know, this is Aphrodisias, Aphrodite Temple, one of the most beautiful temples in, in Turkey, uh, dedicated to God of love, uh, see, Aphrodite, Aphrodite. And I give you an example that I find it very interesting. In Aphrodisias, population was like 12,000 people in the ancient times, during the golden age of Aphrodisias. The stadium of the city was <laughs> holding 30,000 people, which means when they had festivals, you see, for Aphrodite, uh, a lot of people came to, to uh, Aphrodisias and filled that great stadium for 30,000 people. And it was the same case for all the cities with great temples or shrines. Like today, we had, I mean, traveling was more difficult than today, but people traveled, worshiped to their gods and offered sacrifices. This is the Aphrodite of Aphrodisias, like Ephes Artemis, you see. This is again, mixture of Aphrodite and local divinity of nature. Yeah, this is not far from Bodrum. This is Temple of Apollo. It's at Didim. This was a, or, an oracle temple. You know, oracle temples, we have at least two. One in Claros, the second one, the most uh, famous one over here is uh, the one in Didima, Didim Temple. And it's interesting, you have got uh, oracle ro room over here. You have flight of steps. The area where this lady is standing, there was a spring here and uh, a priestess who was speaker of the god Apollo, what she did, she wet her feet in the spring. She inhaled the vapor coming from the spring and then she got state of trance and started talking in the name of God Apollo. That was how the oracle was, was, was given. You know, we can see 
interesting, another temple inside of the temple of Apollo. This was where they were guarding the statue of Apollo. You know, when Persians uh, attack Miletus and Didim Didima, they took to temple, uh, they took to statue of the god to Persia, see, Persia. You know, this is Hecatomnos monumental tomb in Milasa. Most of us, I think we visited the site. You know, this is like prototype of mausoleum in Halicarnassus. This was possibly, you know, the story, this was discovered by the, uh, by the tomb uh, uh, raiders and then they robbed everything, they stole everything. And then after a certain time, you see, the authorities, they got informed about the case and archaeologists, they excavated the tomb area and they discovered an agora nearby a main street, you see, and an altar on, on this site. And unfortunately, the belongings of the tomb is taken, you see, and only a crown from the from the tomb was rediscovered in Scotland, you see, while they were trying to sell it in an auction. So anyway, this was prototype of mausoleum in Harikarnassus. So the sarcophagus, uh, which was inside of the, I mean, uh, of the tomb, had interesting carvings. One side, a katonus having a funeral a meal, uh, see, and on the other side, you see a hunting, hunting scene, hunting lions. It was something for uh, only for royal people, you see, in the ancient times. You know, this is mausoleum of Adikarnasus, uh, one of the seven wonders of the world. Unfortunately, we have got only remains, foundations of the of the mausoleum. The shape and form of the monument very much, very much uh, argued. You see by the scholars the height and the location of the statues uh, where they were located. But uh, still, uh, I don't think we got the right information about the uh, the placement of the statues and the original height of the of the. Uh, monument. You know, this is a Jeppesen, you see, model. Uh, as you can see, there's a podium, a temple-like section, a pyramid, and there was a quadriga at the top. This was Agora area. You see, Agora was next to uh, Mausoleum. This is the only piece left in Turkey, you see, possibly, you know, the carvings of Mausoleum showing Greek and battle between Greeks and Amazons, they were taken to England. They are basically in, a, in the British Museum. You know, and a, another very important site attracted so much uh, pilgrims in the ancient times. It was the famous Zeus temple in Labranda, which is 13 kilometers from Milasa. This was the most sacred shrine for all the Karya, you see, nations. We see the temple over here and the altar of the temple. And we have got the, uh, the, a lot of buildings used during the festivals and banquets, you see, used by the uh, royalty and leading figures of the Karya. And now this temple of Artemis in Ephesus, it was one of the seven wonders. Unfortunately, the temple was destroyed several times, eventually by a very big earthquake. And the side of the temple, it was used like marble quarries, you see. They took all the stones, they used them. They burned some of the marble to make lime. As you can see, they built with the stones of this poor temple, they built Basilica of St. John, the Isave Mosque and the castle. We have got even columns in St. Sophia, uh, uh, see, in Istanbul. 
you know, it was deeply buried, this temple, but it was rediscovered after seven years search by uh, Mr. Wood, British turtle wood. And then it was a big discovery. And then archaeologists digging, digging here, they discovered two temples, one archaic temple, one fourth century temple. And then even when they started digging in the middle of the temple area, they discovered the earliest one dating from 9th century, see, uh, before Christ. Uh, this is Sardis Artemis Temple. Uh, Sardis was the capital city of uh, Lydian Kingdom, as you remember. And also Sardis is one of the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, we have got, uh, see, this great temple, although they spent 500 years it had never got the finishing touches so it's an unfinished temple as you can see some of the columns they didn't have you see flutings of the of the uh of the columns and in the christian era they added a small uh, church chapel see next to this great temple of artemis you know this is uh lagina hecate temple Hecate was a Carian goddess. She's so powerful, so important. And this is the only temple in the whole ancient world dedicated to this goddess, Hecate. And today is being excavated by the same team digging at Statonikia. And there was a sacred road between Statonikia and Lagina Hecate temple on which they carried the key of the sacred shrine. Hecate, she's a very powerful, really goddess. She has power at sea, she has power uh, underground, and she has power sky. Uh, so she's always shown uh, having three uh, bodies and three faces watching, uh, see, three directions, because she was also uh, was the goddess watching the roads and uh, giving safety to the roads. Uh, this is again in Karya. This is Temple of Aphrodite at Kinidos, which is at the end of Dacia Peninsula. It's a circular temple, round temple. It was discovered by Arislav and she, unfortunately she couldn't find the statue see, of Aphrodite. Aphrodite statue was one of the most famous statues of the ancient times. It was carved by Praxiteles and it was the first nude statue of Aphrodite because before the statue, Aphrodite was depicted with garments, you see, not uh, totally nude like this. Look at the coin binted in Kinidos, having also figure of the goddess of the city. Yeah. Kinidos, which is not really far from uh, Bodrum by, by boat. Uh, you have got military harbor over here. And it's always very windy, this part. We have got shrine for Apollo. And down there we have got remains of a couple of Christian churches built in the harbor area. There's a lovely theater by the seaside. This is the commercial harbor one of the biggest and most uh, important cities of Karya region. We have a lot of famous figures from here, but I don't want to take your precious time. Next door, on the way to uh, Soke, we have got this uh, Zeus temple, see, at Euromos. Without any exaggeration, this is the most preserved, really, Roman temple in Anatolia, we can easily say. It was excavated by Emit Serdarodo, one of my professors, and tried, he tried to restore also uh, as a Corinthian order, dating to second century after Christ's time of Emperor Hadrian. You know, all these columns, they have been standing like this all these centuries. If you haven't seen it, don't miss it. It's on the road. Just we can see even from the road that the town of Euromos now is being excavated now. Uh, 
they are working in the Agora. You know, one of the greatest monuments of Hellenistic era was the Zeus uh, altar, I see, from Pergamum, from Pergamum Acropolis. Unfortunately, uh, it was taken to Germany, it's in Berlin now, and it's really a masterpiece of Hellenistic sculpture and architecture. Uh, the School of Sculpture in Pergamum was very famous and all these guys later on they went to Aphrodisias where uh, School of Sculpture also became very famous. You know, it was certainly the most famous and most attractive monument of Hellenistic era dating to second century before Christ. That was time of humanists, you see. And on the uh, altar, we see the gods, the, the war between gods and giants. And, you know, in the eastern part of Turkey, we have got another great uh, monument attracting, attracted all these pilgrims and tourists in the ancient times, and the same today. This is the tomb of Antiochus, the king of Comagene kingdom. That's again, let's say, uh, Hellenistic era. This is not a natural hill, it's an artificial hill. The stones are piled up. And this is really incredible monument. You have got tumulus in the middle, piled hill. It's the tomb area of Antiochus. You have two terraces. East Terrace and West Terrace, and each terrace, you have got all these gods uh, and kings, you see, of the, of the area. Uh, we have got especially Persian, Persian and Greek gods and the ancestors of Antiochus. They are all depicted over here. We see Zeus, we see Heracles, we see Antiochus. All these heads, they were at the top of those bodies and that fell down. Uh, and lions and we see eagles. You know, one of two early locations got so much visitors, you see, in the ancient time. Ancient times, it was the the hospital in Pergamum, dedicated to God of healing. You know, today we see, of course, remains of this great hospital, but it's a nice model. And the, at the gate over here, there was an inscription saying, dying is not allowed here. <laughs> so you can see this was the end of the road coming from Pergamum. This is like reception area of the hospital. And then this is temple of God of healing, Asclepios. This is the hospital section. And in the courtyard, we have got three temples over here. One for uh, God of healing, Asclepios, and for her daughter, his daughter, Hygiene. And now we have a lot of pools, see? Uh, and pools like this, where the uh, patients, they coated their bodies with mud or they just uh, taking bath in this uh, sacred water with healing powers. What was interesting, you see, there were a lot of rooms called incubation rooms. So you wouldn't believe this. Patients, they were sent to these rooms. Uh, they would sleep there. They would have a dream. And in their dream, God of healing would appear to them and tell them what kind of treatment they had to follow. See, if they didn't understand anything, they would tell to the priest what they saw or what they didn't see. And the priest give them, you see, advices, you see. And we have very many, many, many advices. Uh, I don't want to take your time. You know, in Turkey, we have amazing Jewish faith, uh, Jewish uh, heritage also. For example, 
Uh, we have a lot evet, çok of... özür dilerim. Galaxy A51 lütfen mikrofonunuzu kapatabilir misiniz? Teşekkür ediyorum. Evet. You know, in Turkey we have a lot of Jewish signs and symbols in the ancient cities. We all think Jewish people came from Spain and Portugal see, during the time of uh, Bayezid II when Sultan or Sultan sent ships to bring the Sephardic uh, Jews, I mean, suffering from the persecution of local rulers. In fact, in Anatolia, we have so many signs and symbols and synagogues uh, for Jewish uh, faith. For example, biggest synagogue was discovered in Sardis. In Sardis, it was big surprise for Uh, archaeologists when they were trying to excavate in a Roman uh, in the Roman baths they were surprised because they discovered one of the biggest synagogues you see in Anatolia very well preserved synagogue this is where uh, American archaeologists were uh, digging uh, and of course when this synagogue was discovered uh, so much money were sent from all the Jewish uh, people from the different parts of the world. But thanks to this money, we could uh, we could restore the synagogue, the Roman baths, and the buildings in this area. You, know, you all know Priene, Priene de Pirene, a city in Circe area a lovely city dating from fourth century before Christ. But one of the buildings over there, it was identified as synagogue. So even in Priene, we have remains of a synagogue. You know, cities like Miletus, for example, we have uh, remains of a synagogue. This is an interesting inscription from Miletus uh, theater. It's a seat, a uh, reserved, reserved seat for Jewish people, for God-fearers, see? That's a very interesting inscription. Uh, I don't think you could easily see it. You have to know where, where it is located exactly, but it's a reserved seat for uh, Jewish people in Miletus Theater. And I have a lot of menorah signs uh, in the ancient cities. For example, this one in, in Laodicea, you see Laodicea and menorah, and cross on the same column, interesting. And these two, they are from Hierapolis, from Pamukkale Cemetery, Menorah Science, the tombs of the Jewish guys. And of course, uh, in the Ottoman era, when Jewish people, they were having persecutions in Spain and Portugal area, uh, one of our sultans, Bayezid II, sent ships to bring these uh, people. They came to Istanbul and, and Northern Greece, Thessaloniki area and so on and so on. And that was quite an uh, interesting event, you see. That was, I think, 1492. Uh, and, uh, yeah, a lot of synagogues, of course, in Istanbul, in Izmir, in Edirne, in uh, many different parts of Turkey. Some of them are really quite old, Akrida and Yambol, especially in Istanbul. And this is interesting because the, the altar of the synagogue is in the shape of a boat, just reminding people the, the arrival of Jewish people from Spain, Portugal area. You know, when we look at Anatolia in the Roman times, we have got uh, different districts, you see. For example, the area west part of Turkey was called Asia. So when we say St. Paul visited churches in Asia, so we refer to west, west coast of early Anatolia. As you know, the central part was Galatia. We know Cappadocia still we use. South coast, it was Cilicia and so on and so on. You know, we 
briefly talk about journeys of Paul. Paul was uh, coming from a Jewish family and but after he became Christian he did three uh, very important journeys which helped a lot uh, for the spreading of the Christian faith. And if you look at this map, it's very confusing, isn't it? It shows all these travels done by St. Paul, you see, mid of uh, first century, and by boat, by walk, but mainly he was walking really all over the uh, Anatolia and Greece. You know, Paul was born in Tarsus, Let's see, south coast, and in Tarsus we have got a gate named after him, and a, a even well named after after him. We have got in the area these Roman roads still so well preserved. Uh, see, and his first trip, Paul started from Antioch. In fact, Antioch is not on the water, so he started from Samanda, Seleucia. He went to Cyprus and all the way down to Paphos and he was accompanied by Barnabas and then he comes to Perge and from Perge he goes to north through the Taurus mountains and then he visits visits the Antioch but Pisidian Antioch which is called Yalvach today it's a modern town of Yalvach and then he goes to Iconium which is Konya, Lystra and Derbe there, there. These are, uh, yeah, I better show you. You know, Antakya or Antioch was one of the most populated and most important cities of the ancient world. And Peter, St. Peter, one of the very important apostles, came to Antioch and then he established the first church there. So this cave church over here, of course, it had some restorations later on. It is the first church established in Anatolia. And even in Antioch, the name of Christians, you see, I mean, the way we call uh, today Christians named after Christ, first time, this is where they were named after Christ, Christian, the word Christian. It really comes also from Antioch. You know, Antioch today has got one of the finest museums uh, for mosaics, Roman era mosaics discovered. Uh, the famous Laf Daphne uh, area that was kind of residential area of the Antioch. You know, Seman Samanda, this is where Paul started his uh, trips. Yes, today we'll see the famous Titus Tunnel and Samanda area. You know, first city Paul visited was Perge, city of Perge in Anatolia. So we have got this Hellenistic gates. Uh, this is the gates Paul must have seen while he visited the ancient city of Perge. We have got her beautiful theater, a marvelous city one of the most preserved ancient cities uh, in Turkey. You know, after Perge, Paul goes to north and goes to Yalvac. Yalvac is Pisidian Antioch. And today, Pisidian Antioch is very important, you see, because up to that point, Paul was addressing basically to Jewish people. You see, trying to convert them into the Christian faith. But uh, while he had strong reactions, you see, uh, from Jewish people, uh, see, he says in Paisini in Antioch, he says, from now on, we turn to Gentiles. So it's an interesting city, important city, because first time uh, Paul decides to uh, address pagan people, Gentiles. You know, there's a, a big church named after Paul in Pisidian Antioch. You know, Pisidian Antioch, I mean, the, the <laughs> uh, when you drive from uh, Konya 
to Antalya or especially to Pamukkale area. Uh, you have to leave the main road, but a very important site for biblical tours. This is a sacred shrine and temple area for Anatolian god, men, you see. And uh, Paul, uh, after Pisid in Antioch, goes to Konya, uh, which was a quite important city called Iconium. So the word Konya comes from Iconium. And uh, there's a big church dedicated to Mother of Constantine. I'm sure you remember some of your Mother of Constantine, Helen. She was a very devoted Christian. She went to Holy Lands and she discovered the true cross, I see, uh, in the Holy Lands on which Christ was crucified. So you can see uh, in every Cappadocian church, nearly you see Helen and Constantine holding this uh, Holy Cross. You know, we have description of Paul in one of the apocryphal Bibles. Uh, he was going to meet some people, I see, in <laughs> uh, Iconium, and people, they didn't know Paul, so they described how the Paul looked like. They said he had joining eyebrows, I see, and hook nose, and very piercing eyes, I see, and in fact, you can, and bald. And then they said he had bowed legs, Bold legs, joining eyebrows, hook nose, you see, and uh, very piercing black, black eyes. You know, Paul met a young girl uh, in uh, Konya, in Iconium, Tekla, Saint Tekla. She became her his disciple wherever Paul went. I mean, tradition says she followed him. Uh, he, in fact, this is not in the Acts of Apostles, you see. In fact, all the journeys of Paul, I mean, uh, very well, uh, I mean, uh, written in the Acts of Apostles. But the story of Saint Tecla comes from some apocryphal, you see, uh, sources. You know, Lystra is in the south of Konya. It's a hill, uh, see today, is a hook. It's not excavated yet. An inscription there, it was discovered 1885. If you like to see this inscription, is in Konya Archaeological Museum, uh, where I work in the, in the, in the past. Uh, and in Lustra, <laughs> Paul, uh, I mean, created some miracles, you see. So he healed some people, he cured some people, you see. And then people in Lystra, they thought they were uh, gods, you see. They just took them as gods. Uh, so, as, as the Derbe, as you can see on this map, Iconium, Lystra and Derbe, uh, see, these two cities, I mean, not visited too much by, by the groups or by even biblical parties because they are not on the major roads. But like I mentioned, the second inscription also in Konya <coughs> Archaeological Museum. So you can easily go and visit uh, uh, and see these inscriptions. And our second journey of Paul you know, as you can see, he started and visiting Antioch. He started from Jerusalem, Lystra, Derbe. He really revisited the, the cities, Antioch. And after, uh, see, Doreleo, Meskishi area, he was planning to go to Ephesus. But twice he was prevented. Once he was prevented by Holy Spirit. Then he was prevented by Spirit of Christ. And then he was guided to Alexandria Truss. This is not Troy, by the way. This is Alexandria Truss. It's another important city in the south of <coughs> Troy. That was a very convenient uh, passing place, I mean, crossing place in the ancient times. 
So Paul here, he had his vision and then uh, from Macedonia, from Northern Greece, just told him to come over to Europe and help us, you see. And then Paul uh, gets to, this is Alexandria Tross, by the way, it's a very, very big ancient city excavated by Germans, I don't know whether they still continue on that or not. Very big artificial harbor uh, is here. As you know, Troy is further north. This was a very good crossing point you see, in the ancient times from here to Neapolis or Flippi or Thessalonica, if you could go. You know, in this area, we have all these old Roman roads still visible. Uh, you know, when Paul was in Northern Greece, he was in Philippi, and his first comment you see, was a lady called Lydia, and he was from Akisar, Tiatira, Tiatira, uh, Tiatara, Akisar, which is in the north of Izmir. And he goes to Athens, Corinth, and from Corinth, after staying for a while in Corinth, he comes to Ephesus first time during his second missionary trip. He doesn't stay a long time, he stays only three days. He goes to synagogue. We don't know where the synagogue is. Possibly it was in the harbor area, but as you know, in on the steps of Celsus Library, they have a, a menorah sign, you see. Uh, it's somewhere here, you see, that menorah sign. If you miss it before, we can have a look at. You know, time of Paul, Ephesus was one of the most populated and most uh, important cities of Asia. Yes, you have houses of rich and so on and so on. You know, after, after Ephesus, of course, Paul goes, to, goes back to Holy Lands. And the third trip, when he started, the city in his mind was Ephesus, let's see, where he stayed nearly three years, three years. And, you know, Ephesus is not a city of discoveries. I mean, for example, one of the greatest discoveries was Temple of Artemis after search of seven years, a British engineer, Turtle Wood, he discovered the Temple of Artemis. And John, the apostle, the most, uh, one of the beloved apostles of Christ, you see, John, the, the apostle was in Ephesus. He lived in Ephesus for a while. While he was staying in Ephesus, he was exiled to Patmos. And then when Domitian was killed, he could return to Ephesus. You know, we do believe Mary uh, came also to Ephesus. Uh, we do believe John, when the Christ was on the cross, you see, Christ says, here is your mother, here is your son. And then uh, we do believe John took care of the Virgin Mary after the crucifixion of, of Christ. You know, one of the very important pilgrimage places in Turkey, especially for Catholic people, uh, and also for Muslim people is the House of Virgin Mary. And the House of Virgin Mary was discovered after the visions of a German nun. Although he had never been to Ephesus for a long time, she couldn't leave her even bed. But she had sufferings of Christ, stigmata, her hands were bleeding, and then she had really sufferings of Christ. And she had all the visions and eventually, a priest friend of hers put down, I see, all this information and a book was published. And later on, three Lazarus priests coming from Izmir, uh, just following the description of uh, Catherine and Mary, because uh, in this book, the location of Virgin Mary's house is described beautifully, you see. They discovered the house and this is a small church built over the top of, uh, see, a Roman house dating time of uh, 
Virgin Mary and Christ. You know, I'm sure you remember even Pope, uh, former Pope, visited the uh, House of Virgin Mary and Basilica of St. John. These are very important uh, religious sites, you see, for Christian world. You know, 1956, two statues of Artemis, they were discovered in the city hall of Ephesus. That was a big surprise for archaeologists. They were magnificently well preserved. Let's see, Artemis the Great and Artemis the Beautiful. They are both in Ephesus, same museum. In 1993, they discovered a special cemetery for the uh, great fighters of ancient times, Gladiators uh, Cemetery. And it was interesting because all the bones and uh, skulls with the holes and bones uh, with the traces of cuts and so on and so on. Uh, you know, another discovery in Ephesus was discovery of Arsinoe tomb. Arsinoe was sister of Cleopatra and she had a big fight with Cleopatra over the Egyptian throne and eventually defeated by Caesar and Caesar after defeating her took her to Rome. Uh, thanks to Lord they didn't kill her like they used to do normally but she was given permission to take shelter in Ephesus uh, great temple of Artemis. See, so she was in the in the temple under the protection of <clears throat> Artemis in her temple. But when Cleopatra and Mark Antony came to Ephesus, uh, she was killed <clears throat> in the temple, which was a big scandal. You know, a long time the monument over here was known as the tomb of a young girl, and we were wondering who was this young girl to be buried just in the middle of the city. And then <coughs> a couple of Austrian archeologists, I've been examining the tomb and skeleton and skull and so on and so on. They realized, see, it was the tomb of sister of Cleopatra. And this upper part of, you see, this uh, form of the tomb, you wouldn't believe this, I don't have the picture with me, but it is very similar to the architecture of the lighthouse of Alexandria, the top of it. A very important uh, religious uh, sea site in Ephesus, cave of St. Paul. It's a kind of cave church, and then we have got some frescoes on the walls. We see Paul and surprising for us we have got also a figure of saint tecla this, this young girl from iconium from konya who became disciple of paul uh, we have story of seven sleepers of ephesus story of this young seven young men sleeping 200 or 300 years in a cave they were trying to escape from the persecution of uh, Roman authorities. We have the same story in the Muslim version, you see. I mean, the only difference I mean, in one version, I think Muslim one, they slept 200 years, Christian one 300 years or vice versa, uh, but exactly the same story. You know, Paul stayed in Ephesus nearly three years but eventually he had very, very big riot against him, it's the Silversmith riot, because while he was giving his sermons, he was always telling people, you don't worship to the gods made by human hands. So biggest uh, income for Ephesus in those centuries was Temple of Artemis and also Silversmith, you see, and goldsmith, especially silversmith, they used to make images of the temple, statues of Artemis in silver. Uh, like you go to Paris and you buy the images of Eiffel Tower. This was a great income for the city and especially for silversmith. And then they 
had a meeting and they said, we are losing money. This guy, you see, his sermons is very, very dangerous and very disturbing for our trade. And then they provoked the people of Ephesus, uh, this great theater, uh, one of those days filled with perhaps 30,000 people shouting hours and hours, Diana is great, Diana is great. And Paul wanted to come to theater and talk to these people, but he was prevented by his friends and Roman authorities. And he left Ephesus. And of course, he goes back to North again, Alexandria Truss once more to go to Greece. And as you can see, uh, from Ephesus goes to Troas and then he goes to Philippi, Thessaloniki and all the way down to Corinth. But instead of taking a ship from here <laughs> back to uh, Jerusalem, Caesarea area, he goes back to Philippi and Troas comes back, walks from Troas to Assos about 20 miles, uh, see, and then he takes a ship and calls it Miletus, you see, where he meets the elders of the church down there, and then uh, goes back to, see, uh, Jerusalem area. You know, later on, Paul, I'm sure you all know, he was arrested, taken to Rome after the great fire of, uh, great fire. By the way, uh, see, comes to, from Alexander the Truss, he walks to Assos, where we have this great temple of Athena, and calls it Miletus. In the Lion Harbor, he meets with the elders of the church there. And even they stop, make a stop at Patara, Patara, and back to Tyra and uh, Jerusalem. And then he is arrested. On the way to Rome, this time, the boat stops at Myra, see Myra in Dembre, where we have that St. Nicholas Church, which is the Father Christmas for European friends, of course. You know, the end of Paul and Peter, two great figures of Christian faith, I mean, came after the great fire in Rome Paul, since he was a Roman citizen, he was beheaded, I see, at the Ostia Gate area. And as to Peter, he was crucified, but he was crucified upside down. And the area where he was crucified, we have got Church of St. Peter today and Vatican, I see, as the exact same place. You know, as to seven churches, uh, see, this all happened during the time of Domitians, where Christians, they were severely persecuted. And John, who was head of the church in Ephesus during that time, he was exiled to Patmos, island of Patmos. And while he was there in a cave, I'm sure those been to Patmos, they have visited the, he visited the, the cave where John had his vision, and in his vision, he was told by Christ to send messages to the seven cities of Asia. Yeah, as you can see over here, first city was Ephesus, second city was Izmir, Smyrna, Pergamum, Pergama, Hayatara is Akisar, Sardis is next to uh, present day Salihli, Philadelphia is Alashir, and Laodicea, which is next to Pamukkale area. Of course, when we say seven churches, the time when these letters were, messages were sent, there were no church buildings, you see. So when we say church, this refers to early Christians, let's say, living in these cities. And you know, some of these letters, they have praising words for the early Christians. Some of the letters are very strong. I mean, you have accusations, 
uh, because they didn't behave properly, you see. And for some Pergamum, they say, you need to repent, you see. And some of them, they were following false prophets or prophecies. Some of them, uh, <laughs> see, fallen asleep. So this is really interesting. Uh, letters, I don't want to take your precious time. Normally, if we had time, we could read these letters and try to uh, explain what they try to say. You know, this is Basilica of St. John, where John lived, in fact, on this hill. And after he died, he's buried. In fact, this is the burial place of the St. John the Apostle. So John was head of the church here in Ephesus, exiled to Patmos, and then returned to Ephesus. And in between, we have got Paul coming to Ephesus. So it is interesting. They were not in Ephesus at the same uh, time. You know, there's another church called Ch Church of Virgin Mary, double Church of Virgin Mary. Sorry, this is not a very good picture, but this is where the Third Ecumenical Council uh, took place. And the main subject was the title of Mary. <coughs> and they decided Mary was Theodokos. Mary was mother of God, I see. And our second city getting message was Izmir, Simirna. Uh, we have got beautiful Agora marketplace in Simirna. I'm sure you remember Homer was uh, born in Simirna. And the oldest part of Izmir uh, is Bayrakli, is where we have got the oldest uh, settlement of Simirna, excavated by Ekrem Akurval for a very long time. You know, one of the greatest figures, religious figures of Sibirna was Polycarp. Polycarp was head of the church, but he was taken to stadium, which is on the slopes of, of Kadite Kale today, and he was forced to deny his fate, but he refused so. Uh, he refused that, that, that uh, see, suggestion. And then he was martyred. He was, you see, they tried to burn him. The fire didn't touch him. Eventually he was killed by a sword, you see. So there's a big church in Izmir facing to Grand Ephes Hotel, this St. Polycarp Church, where you see all these frescoes showing Polycarp and his martyrdom and so on. So. There are third church or city getting message was Pergamum. You know, in the letter it says, I know where the Satan's seat is located. Letter starts like that. I know where the Satan's throne or seat is located. Bible scholars, they are all, I mean, arguing about this, what this letter meant, which building it was, see, seat of Satan. So, of course, it, it could be the famous temple for deified Roman emperors like Traianus Tra Temple, Tra Temple of Traianus, we see the picture is on the Acropolis. It could be seed of Satan, this Zeus altar where you have got all these gods and goddesses, nearly all the every single Olympian gods depicted. Or it could be the hospital, you see, hospital of <coughs> the Pergamum, because there was, we had great physicians like Galen, say Galenus of Pergamum working over here, but also there was a temple healing. So like today, you have to <laughs> make your choice. Either you choose a, a, a physician doctor, you see, <coughs> who had training of medicine or you would go for, uh, see, faith healing. So very possibly, uh, I mean, it could be also a seat of Satan for, uh, see, for Bible, some Bible scholars. And of course, serpent is symbol of the medicine today uh, and the Christianity and Muslim faith didn't welcome serpent, see, so warmly. 
you know, Fort City is Akisar, Tiatira or Tayatara, where we have only one remains of a street left, see, and the rest of the city underneath the modern town of Akisar, which is a very big, very lively town today. And of course, Sardis, the capital city of Libyan Kingdom, one of the richest kingdoms in the ancient times. This was Pactolus River today is nearly dry, but it was one of the gold bearing rivers of ancient times. Libyans, they collected basically electrum, you see, from there. And even they minted first coins, uh, see, after really human history. And first coins, they were made of electrum. And later on, they managed to uh, separate the silver and gold. Uh, and archaeologists discovered refineries where they did this uh, process see, in service. And of course, the most famous king of Libya was Croesus or Karun or Croesus, one of the richest guys on earth. You have got the expression to be as rich as, to be as rich as Croesus or Karun, you see. Yeah, this is the temple in Acropolis of the city. And we have a lot of hills, Turkish people, even they call these hills thousand and one hills to just uh, trying to say the, their number is so, so, so much. So the biggest of them belongs to, of course, Aleptes, Saleptes and uh, some other important kings. And most of these tumuli, tumuluses, they had great uh, tomb, tomb belongings, you see, and gifts uh, put. This is the synagogue in Sardis, beautiful mosaic. Uh, and you can see it looks like a church, in fact, but I mean, we discovered inscriptions saying it was uh, a synagogue and the names of Jewish guys and so on and so on. It's a certainly a synagogue. Originally, it was a part of a Roman gymnasium building. It was not built as synagogue. That's why it has got quite elongated, interesting form. This is the Imperial Hall of the gymnasium, gymnasium bath complex. It was restored to its former glory by the archaeologist. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Philadelphia was founded by one of the Pergamon kings. He built the city for his brother. That's why the name is means the city of brotherly love, brotherly love. So uh, even the, of course, Philadelphia is in the United States, is named after the Philadelphia over here. And our last city is Laodicea, where uh, we have got very, very successful excavations done by Potomkale University by Celal Shimshek and one of the seven churches and Jalal Shimshek has been looking for church buildings. In fact, you know, <coughs> a lot of churches in Laodicea, but the new one was discovered. It was the biggest surprise, see, over here, and it was restored and they built a roof over it. And uh, this is the, I mean, first year after the discovery of the, of, the, of the church. It had a lot of mosaics and roof. And I think this is one of our groups. It must be visiting the church a couple of years ago. Uh, Laodicea is going to overshadow a lot of cities in the future. It's one of the richest cities and one of the wealthiest cities of the antiquity and it's the last church and this is the church getting the strongest 
accusations, uh, say, in the letters. That this is the baptism pool of the church. You can see the, the seating area for priesthood. You know, in Hierapolis area, we had some interesting discoveries in Pamukkale area, for example, they discovered recently <laughs> the plutonium. This is the key entry to the underworld, the world of Hades. You know, the problem with this, there's a, a poisonous carbon dioxide gases coming out. So in the ancient times, this was like Disneyland because the priests, uh, <laughs> They were showing off, I mean, just throwing birds or bringing bulls, uh, you see, uh, to the entry of the, this cave and tunnel and poor animals, they died immediately. And then according to different times of the, of the day, you see, the gas, the gas, I mean, carbon di dioxide was very high, for example, night time and early in the morning and again night time but during the daytime the level of the poisonous gas is is went down went down so the priests knowing about this i mean <laughs> they use it so well to attract the people it was quite big attraction attracting a lot of uh, people in the ancient times this is yeah this is the round temple and the pool entry to the underworld even in the i don't know how many years ago a couple of tourists trying to enter to this <coughs> cave nighttime they died they found them uh, their bodies in the following day this is the statue of hades the lord of the underworld discovered this is in the local museum down there it's interesting in this area, there's a martyrdom of Philip, you see. And then in the recent years, Italian archaeologists discovered, they say they discovered the tomb of Apostle Philip, you see. Of course, it's very much uh, again argued, disputed uh, by among the scholars. This is Philip the Apostle or Philip the Evangelist, you see. So Italians, they say, this is the Philip the Apostle, you see, one of the one of the apostles. This was a, a quite interesting discovery. It's at the top of the hill. Theater is here, somewhere here. You have a, as you can see, it's an old ancient road leading you to the martyrdom over here. And then the church was discovered just below the martyrdom. You know, Cappadocia area is, of course, a great monastic center of the, of the uh, Anatolia, where we have got amazing rock cut churches. What's important about Cappadocia, although they are rock cut churches, we can follow incredible richness of the iconography in these churches and then their forms, their plans. Uh, see, they, are, they follow in certain ways, follow the plan of masonry built churches, but certain ways they are so different from, uh, from the art of Constantinople and other parts. You know, this is interesting, you see, in the early days of Christianity, they were hermits or monks, uh, preferred isolated life, for example. They lived at the top of trees. They just lived in the caves. We have got some of them living at the top of columns. And in Cappadocia, we have got <laughs> quite interesting choice. They preferred these fairy chimneys. For example, one of them in Pashaba, you have got three levels. You have got church, small chapel over here. And then you have got the, the, the uh, house or the living quarters of a, of a monk over here. This was the Cappadocian counterpart of this 
uh, monks choosing isolated life. This Gorena village, you know, in Cappadocia we have got thousands of churches and most incredible iconography. Some of the churches painted by artists coming from Constantinopolis, like Tokala Church. Some of the churches done by the local priests, uh, local artists, see? This is Tokala Church again, 10th century, Christ calling the apostles. St. George, did you know George was from Cappadocia and became patron saint of England later on. Crucifixion of Christ. This is done by a local artist, you can see interesting anatomical features of, of Christ. Karshi is last judgment scene over here, last supper. 40 martyrs of Sebasta. They were frozen on a see on a frozen lake. Long story. This is Dormition of Mary. It's the biggest church in Cappadocia area, Tokala Church. You know, we have got also another monastic uh, monastic area or monastic monasteries in this area, Buffa Lake area. I'm sure some of you, you climb to the mountain, but we have a lot of uh, churches, monasteries on the islands at the Buffa Lake and at the top of the mountain, you see. You know, in Istanbul, of course, we have great mar marvels of Byzantine art, one of them, of course, Saint Sophia. I think it's the greatest monument for all ages, uh, built in sixth century, used thousand years uh, as a church, another 500 uh, as a mosque. And you see the Virgin Mary and Christ, one of the beautiful mosaics. We have a lot of Ottoman calligraphy in Saint Sophia up to the, this construction of Milano Cathedral this was the biggest dome ever built, you see, in the world. Upper galleries, oh, I see Christ, St. John the Baptist, and Cora Church, that's the, that represents the last golden age of Byzantine Empire. We have got Dormition of Mary. We have got all the scenes related to life of Virgin Mary. For example, Mary is presented to the temple. Christ, Mary, and donors uh, of, the, of the church. Last Judgment, one of the most detailed, really, scenes of Last Judgment in Cora Church, Virgin Mary and former prophets. Christ feeding the 5,000, multiplying the bread and the nativity on the right hand side. You know, we have some Muslim, I mean, uh christian i mean muslim religious buildings we briefly covered them very quickly iznik green mosque in iznik where first and seventh ecumenical councils met we have got a, a roman theater and also church of uh, uh sophia saint sophia and we have got a couple of uh, Muslim holy men like Haji Bektash Veli uh, we visited with our group, see, going to Cappadocia. We have got a big monastic complex. This is one of the very important pilgrimage spots for Muslim people in, in Turkey. We have got, of course, Mevlana, Celalet, Rumi, tomb and shrine. This was the former monastery of the Merlin Dervishes. This is the mosque of Haji Bayram Bili, is another very important sacred man, important for Muslim people. In Istanbul, we have Ayyub al Ansari tomb, very much visited by millions of Muslim people. See, he was the a friend of Prophet Muhammad, and he was the standard bearer of the Arabic armies. Arabs, they tried very hard to capture, conquer, see, Constantinopolis. During one of the sieges, he was killed. A, an arrow hit him, 
an arrow coming from the city walls and they buried him in that district and after the fall of Constantinopolis, I met the conqueror and his teacher. Uh, they were looking for the, the, the tomb of Eyüp and they discovered the site of the, of the tomb and they built a monumental tomb, a mosque. And today is one of the biggest cemeteries in Istanbul because everyone wanted to be buried, you see, next to this holy person. This is the tomb of Bevlana, one of the very, very important pilgrimage places. And Konya is really a sacred city. We have a lot of theological schools and universities of Seljuk era, 13th century. As you know, Seljuk Turks, uh, they were the first Turks arriving to Anatolia and their first capital was Iznik and the second capital was Konya where they really built uh, greatest monuments of the 13th century like Karatay Medrese, this is a tile museum. You know, these tiles, uh, they are not from Konya, they are from Beşir, from famous summer palace of Seljuk sultans. They are so beautiful. We have got the greatest collection in Konya. You see people sitting in Turkish style. And I see Asiatic eyes in Geminare, you see, Medrese. The workmanship of the facade, I think, is a really masterpiece of uh, Celtic art. Yeah, I got. Quranic verses put on the on the facade. It's a museum of Seljuk stone works today. You know, wearing dervishes tradition still continues. This is an order established by Mevlana, especially by his son Sultan Belet. And I'm sure you must have seen this uh, ritual. It's not a dance, it's a religious ceremony. And <coughs> it's very mesmerizing ceremony. You know, you know very early mosque in, in Konya area. At the beginning, since they didn't know too much about uh, central domes, or the buildings with domes and half domes, uh, see. Uh, Celtic Turks, they built big mosques using a lot of pillars like this one, this uh, Alatin mosque around 13th century. In Konya, we have got the, the tombs of famous Celtic sultans like Alatin Keikubat or Kılıçaslan. You know, it's another masterpiece of Muslim architecture, another mosque with this time uh, wooden pillars, wooden pillars. This is in Beşir, Eşrefoğlu Mosque. You know, Ottoman dynasty lasted, as you can see, up to 1922. Started with Osman, it's one of the longest uh, lasting dynasties of the world without any break. Power stayed in the same family is really interesting. And our first capital was Bursa, where we have got this amazing monuments of the early sultans. Whereas at the beginning, ablution fountains, they are inside of the mosque, green mosque. And in Bursa, you have got all these mosques decorated with beautiful tiles with green and blue colors. We have got tombs of early sultans also, like the tomb of Osman, founder of Ottoman Empire, his son Orhan. And this is the tomb of Sultan Mehmet, who was the second founder of the Ottoman uh, Empire. We have two tombs belonging to unlucky crown prince see, of Ottoman dynasty. One of them is Jem, the son of Mehmet the Conqueror, uh, who after defeat, being defeated by his brother, he escaped and he died in, uh, in Italy. He was poisoned, in fact, in Vatican. And I'm sure you all know the story of 
uh, Mustafa, the crown prince, son of the Suleiman the Magnificent, and he was killed with the order of Suleiman. He was strangled uh, in a royal tent. So I bought unlucky, I would say, prince they are buried over here. You know, in Istanbul, you have got this, this amazing imperial mosque like Suleymaniye built by Sinan Blue Mosque. You have got Selimiye Mosque in Edirne at this time built again by Sinan. You have got this tiny mosque, but in my humble opinion, is the most beautiful mosque in Istanbul. Rustam Pasha Mosque, Grand Vizier of Suleyman. You yeah, have got the best tiles of 16th century in this tiny mosque. You know, as a last thing in Istanbul, in Topkapı Palace, we have holy relics of Muhammad, uh, our prophet Muhammad. So when Selim, well, Ottoman Sultan Selim captured Egypt, uh, you see, he brought most of the holy relics, see, to Istanbul and also when we lost Hijaz, all those areas in the Ottoman era, last, I would say, governor of the area, Hijaz sent also uh, the other relics to Istanbul. So we have got the, in these golden boxes and all these beautifully decorated boxes, we have got for some mantle, holy mantle of Mohammed. We have got footprint of Muhammad. We have got a letter dictated by him. Uh, believe it or not, we have got not only in Topkapı Palace, but in many mosques in Turkey, we have got hair, a hair, piece of hair from the beard of Prophet Muhammad and from the hair of Prophet Muhammad. We have got seal of Muhammad in Topkapı Palace. You know, in <coughs> Kade, we have got this famous black stone. In fact, it was pure white, but because of sins of human beings, it became black. It is called Hajir al -Esfet. So during the pilgrimage, people, they used to touch and kiss the stone. And Ottomans, each time they send a golden casket, see, around, put to be put around this stone. And each time they send new one and the, the old one brought to Istanbul and kept as one of the holy relics. You have got early samples of Quran. You have got some interesting Christian objects also. For example, we have got the hand and part of the skull of St. John the Baptist in Topkapı Palace. Again, a box keeping the hair uh, from the beard of Muhammad. 